century. <laughs> ah, that... I believe we have revealed something about <laughs> the learner. <laughs> I think it's, maybe it's, it's, it's good to start at the moment, I guess. It's about 2 o'clock mm -hmm. now, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and also, the number of participants is already reached to 100 already. Okay. Mm. Yes, a good time to start. Yeah. So uh, let's, uh, let's, let's, let, uh, let's start. Then. And good afternoon and welcome all the participants uh, in and out Thailand to this third event by PSU Open Mobility 2022. And for today's session, uh, our invited speakers will present and discuss ideas uh, and experiences uh, regarding one of the most crucial issues in ELT communities called characteristics of 21st century English language teachers. Before we move on, let me introduce uh, our today's moderator, uh, Mrs. Vimon Rat Ratanayat. Mrs. Vimon Rat Ratanayat has been working as an English lecturer at Prince of Sanghai University, uh, Thailand for many years. And she's one of the active lecturers who is interested in teaching English as a second or foreign language, second language acquisition, psycholinguistics and curriculum development. And without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Mrs. Vimonrat Ratanaya to continue the rest of the session. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Yusuf, for a nice introduction. So welcome every participant from Thailand and all over the world. <laughs> because now I, I know from the registra registration there are almost seven registrants and from over 40 countries. And to me, it's really amazing, okay? But uh, today, uh, as uh, Dr. Yusuf introduced me, I'm Vimon Rat Ratanayan. I'm here to be a moderator to lead the session today. And welcome again to the third event of PSU Open Mobility 2022 for virtual visiting professor program. So today we will go through the roles of English teachers in the 21st century, which under the topic of uh, characteristics of 21st century English language teachers. So before we jump up to the content of the session, please allow me to briefly introduce the speaker today, Dr. Willie a. Rinandia. Dr. Willy is a language teacher educator with extensive uh, teaching experience in Asia, and he currently teaches applied linguistic courses at the National Institute of Education at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And he also has given more than 100 keynote presentations at international ELT conferences and has published extensively in the area of second language education. And moreover, uh, his publication include Language Teaching Methodology and Anthology of Current Practice in 2002, uh, and also Student Center Cooperative Learning in 2019. So he maintains a large teacher profession, professional development forum called Teacher Voices. And he also have his website called Willy ELT Conan, so that uh, most of us can contact him, <laughs> okay? And regarding the topic today, as you know, about the characteristic of 21st century English language teacher, to me, is it clear that the 21st century classroom needs are very different from the 20th century one, right? So why is it important? And why we as a language teacher need to know and need to prepare our teaching, uh, or our teaching technique, whatever, to match with this 21st century. And also, the, uh, the, the really important factor, our learners or students in the 21st century as well. Okay, sounds interesting, right? <laughs> and let's explore together by welcoming Dr. Willy. Okay, Dr. Willy, the floor is yours now, please. Thank you, thank you very much. Always a pleasure to be with friends and colleagues from Thailand and also from other places in the region, in Asia and also beyond. I just want to say hello to those from Indonesia, from Thailand, from Malaysia, from Korea, and also from some other, uh, from Bhutan as well. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before I start, let me just say again, uh, my university, very briefly, it's called Nanyang Technological 
University is located in Singapore, very near from where you know you live and from where you work. And uh, it's, it's, it's a very good university. And we have a very strong uh, language programs, language education programs. If you're thinking, just like Fatima Laila, thinking about coming and doing your PhD or master's degree uh, in language education, please consider coming to uh, my university. And now that COVID-19 is over, uh, if you happen to be in Singapore, please drop me a line and I'll be very happy to give you a guided tour to the university free of charge. And after the guided tour, we'll go and have lunch together, but lunch will be for you to pay, not for me to pay. <laughs> okay. So that's a good deal, yeah? Free guided tour, but lunch will be on you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, topic today is on characteristics of 21st century language teachers. Uh, you will soon find out that some of the ideas are considered classic in language education, but some are fairly in line with what is expected of us as language teachers, language teacher educators in, uh, you know, in today's world, in the 21st uh, century. The, uh, one of the most important thing, one of the most important takeaway of today's session is this. I think as a language teacher, as a professional language teacher, I think we need to be ready to embrace change because change is happening every day. Change is happening so fast. If we don't change, I think change will change us. Can, can I say that again one more time? I think that's a nice, it has a nice ring to it. If we don't change, I think change is going to change us. And change is happening so fast, as I said earlier on today. Yeah, so we need to keep up with the uh, uh, changes that are happening uh, around us. It's not easy to change. As you all know, I myself experience a lot of difficulties in, you know, changing things that I feel have been working for me for many years. But because time is now different, I will need to make important and substantial changes in the way I approach uh, you know, the subject matter that I'm teaching and in the way that I relate to my students and also in the way I design my lesson, my uh, activities and things like that. So keep in mind, this is probably the most important takeaway, change. If we don't change, I think change will change us. Throughout my presentation, I will be asking you six questions. And these six questions are the main ideas that I want to share with you. These are the six ideas that I think are important for us to be a 21st language education teacher. So the first question is, are you professionally competent as a language teacher, as a language teacher educator, or as a language teaching uh, professional? professional professionalism are you professionally competent number two again another classic question which is going to be important uh, you know today and also in the future is are you a reflective teacher if you don't reflect on your past experiences i think it's very difficult for you to change it's very difficult for you to grow it's very difficult for you to become a better person in the future. Number three, I think number three, again, has been around for some time, but today in the 21st century, I think we will have to adopt a more student-centered pedagogy. And I will explain why student-centered teaching becomes so important today because of the uh, digital revolution that we are witnessing uh, at the moment. We can't no longer do the kind of teaching that we have always done in the past. Teacher-centered, giving lecture for one hour, for example. I think that kind of teaching will have to be, you know, very drastically uh, reduced. And we need to adopt a more student-centered uh, kind of uh, pedagogy or learning or teaching in the classroom. The next one is technology, basically. 
are we familiar with the kind of technology that we need to learn in order to help us become a better teacher in order for us to be able to engage students during the learning process? Are we digitally savvy? Uh, the next one is the idea that lifelong learning is another important characteristic of anyone of 20th century, uh, 20th century teacher, 21st century teacher, and maybe also in the future, 22nd, 23rd, and so on and so forth. Are you a continuous learner? Are you a lifelong learner? The last one, I think is very important as well, the, the idea that people, every one of you can become better. Every one of you can become a very successful teacher. Every one of you can be a, you know, a better teacher. Uh, you know, the best teacher that you can be, if and only if you have this characteristic known as gritty. Are you a gritty teacher? I'll explain what it means later, yeah? So these are six ideas that I want, that I want to share with you this afternoon. And at the end of my presentation today, I'm going to invite you to add more ideas. What are other things that you feel are important for us to embrace change and also to face the uh, many changes that are happening uh, around us so that we can sort of, you know, go with the flow and become more able to deal with the uh, challenges that we are facing in teaching our students today. So six ideas. And then at the end, I will ask you to, you know, uh, suggest any other thoughts, any other ideas that you feel are important for us to become a better teacher. So let me begin with number one. Again, the question again for number one is, are uh, we, all of us here, are we professionally competent? I think this one is very easy to understand, the importance of being professionally competent in any area uh, of work, whether it's medicine, whether it's law, whether it's in education, whether it's in language education, we need to have, we need to understand what is required of us in our job as a professional teacher. In other words, there are professional standards that we have to uphold. Now, in our case, I think we are looking at two things at least. Do we have sufficient knowledge about the language that we are teaching? Number two, do we have the kind of skills that are needed for us to reach out and to engage our students during the uh, learning process in and out of the classroom. So knowledge and skills. And I will explain a bit more uh, later in relation to the kind of knowledge and skills in language uh, education. But another, there's another thing that is also extremely important, values. Do we have the right values as a language teacher or as a language teacher educator? Yeah, you may be one of, the, one of the best doctors in the world, but if your value is not there, then you'll be doing things that is for the sake of money, for example. In the same thing, uh, in our job, in our, you know, in our work as a teacher, I think we need to uphold certain values, things like integrity, things like professionalism, things like collegiality. We need the fact that we need to work together with other people. I think that is one of the most important uh, skills that everyone living in the 21st century will have to learn. Are you able to work together with your colleagues for the good, for the benefits of your students? Do you value diversity? That's another big thing, another big topic in education. Your students come to you from different backgrounds, different experiences, different abilities, different preferences, different interests, different motivations, and so on and so forth. And, have, and, and, and you simply have to address the uh, different needs of your students. Yeah, you can't play favoritism, for example, because uh, your students are from, you know, mostly are from Thailand. If you have an international student, for example, in a classroom, they may feel left out. So it's our job, again, to be able to address the, uh, different, uh, the differences that we see in the classroom. Finally, change again. There is another important value that we need to uphold. Are we afraid of change or are we brave enough to embrace change in our work, in our job? Zooming in now, focusing 
more specifically to our job as a language teacher, as an English language teacher, there are four areas of professionalism that I want to discuss with you. Yeah. Uh, please raise your hand if there's anything that you are not very clear, if you want to interject, if you want to share your thoughts. I think the uh, moderator, Ajahn Wimorat, will be very yes. happy to entertain you yes. <laughs> if you have any questions. Yeah. My pleasure. <laughs> yes, very good. Uh, four areas, language and culture. Mm -hmm. Number two is pedagogy. Number three, content, content knowledge. And the last one is context. Very brief. I'm going to explain what this means to you. Number one, professionally competent, yeah? This is an issue, really, for English language teachers in the region. Our expectation is for all English language teachers teaching in high school, teaching in primary school, teaching at the university level to be highly proficient in the English language. In other words, we want them to be fluent users, fluent speakers, good writers of the English language. The reality, however, is not there yet. I know this for a fact. Uh, if I could give an example of, you know, the kind of proficiency that I know of, from places in the region, uh, I think the government or the Minister of Education would like the English language teachers to possess a proficiency level, at least at the C1 level, C1 level, or at least at the B2 level. But the reality, many of the English language teachers are not there yet. Yeah, but the good thing is that Governments, Ministry of Education in Thailand, for example, in Vietnam, in Indonesia, and in many other places are really paying attention uh, to this issue. And they provide very extensive support uh, you know, that comes in different forms in order to help teachers to become more proficient in the English language. You may be wondering how important is proficiency in the language for someone to become you know, to be considered a proficient and professionally competent Thanks, English Allah. language teacher. Uh, I have here a summary, summary from Thailand, uh, Ajahn Ming Sawas Dipon. Okay. She is an English teacher. And I'm going to ask you how important is English language proficiency, in your opinion, for teachers to have in order for them to be able to teach professionally, to teach professionally well, in the English language classroom, either at the secondary school level, high school level, or even at the university level? Is it on a scale of one to 10? Very important, extremely important, rather important. Mink. Audio. Your audio is up. I'm sorry. So yes. um, I actually have two answers for your question properly. Yes. I would say that uh, language proficiency it is of utmost importance mm. for me I would say that if you can be like a C2 level mm. uh, speaker or English language user that would be fantastic yeah however the truth is what you have said earlier that yeah. many of our uh, like uh, peers uh, are not there yet yeah. so they are working toward uh, that point mm. I would say that you really need a proficiency that it's good yeah. enough for you to mm. teach your students confidently yes. because your students mm. will look up to you as I a like role that. model. Yes, yes. And that is extremely important. The yes. students should be able to see you as a model of a competent user of the English language. Right, right. So the research that I've seen in this area is that, yes, proficiency is important up to a certain point, up to B2, C1, Beyond that, proficiency uh, is no longer as important as other factors that can have an influence on the effectiveness of your teaching. So up to C1, B2, C1. Below that, I think you will be struggling quite a bit and your students will have a hard time maybe understanding you, understanding your explanation. And uh, you may not be able to provide the kind of feedback that the students need in order for them to improve on their English language proficiency if your own proficiency is not wonderful yet. Yeah, 
But beyond B2C1, I think what is more important is the teacher's ability to engage the students in the learning process. Yeah, so the point I'm trying to make here is if your proficiency is not up there yet, still at B1 level, I think there is room for you to grow. There is room for you to become better so that people would consider you as a, uh, as a teacher who is professionally uh, competent. There's another dimension today, because in the past, we did not really look at this issue very carefully, but today, I think we are very, uh, very... Uh, I leave one, uh, one quick question. Yes. Uh, from, from your experience, are we yes. more important between language proficiency of teachers or, mm. teaching, pro or teaching competence of teachers? Okay. Uh, I think I mentioned that earlier on. Uh, up to a certain point, I think we need to work very hard on improving the proficiency of the teachers up to B2. Yeah. But the question of which one is more important, uh, proficiency of pedagogy, I think it's, it's a very difficult question to answer. I think both are important, uh, but at a certain level, proficiency may be more important. Mm -hmm. But once that threshold of proficiency has been crossed, mm -hmm. I think pedagogy becomes mm -hmm. more important when it comes to engaging students in the classroom. Yeah. Okay, so both and... are important. And I'm, I'm going to say a bit more about pedagogy a little bit more, yeah? Mm -hmm. So the other dimension of, of language competence, because language is often very often associated with culture. In the past, we used to think that when we teach English, we also need to introduce the conventions, the rules, the regulations, the culture of native English speaking teachers, right? Not anymore. The reason being English is now used increasingly by the world. And the world means people from different parts of the world with different language backgrounds, people from the Philippines, people from Malaysia, people from Indonesia, people from Thailand. And they have different ways of expressing their thoughts, their ideas in the English language. So if what Ajahn Viram, uh, Wimon Rat say is not, you know, <laughs> well aligned to the uh, native speaking you know mm -hmm. english standards or conventions i think we have to learn how to mm -hmm. communicate with her and how to understand her mm -hmm. using different you know frame mm -hmm. of mind basically mm -hmm. so today what i'm trying to say is that we need to be socially and culturally competent okay. users of english as well not yes. only to be able to speak well appropriately politely, nicely uh, to people from native English speaking countries, but also to people from other countries in the world as well. So the major, major change that I've seen happening is that native speaker competence or native speaking, native speaker accents is no longer or should not be used as the uh, only uh, target of attainment for our students. Today, we are looking at intelligibility. That's number one. Mm -hmm. And number two is acceptability. That's number two. So both of these ideas are equally important. You need to be intelligible. And number two, the way you speak will have to be considered as acceptable. Especially if you're an English language teacher, I think people demand a certain a level of a higher standard from you than, for example, if you work you know, uh, in a shopping center, for example, where you deal with tourists, uh, you don't have to speak with very good standard English. But if you're in a classroom teaching English, then I think your speech will have to be intelligible and also acceptable uh, at the same time. I hope that makes sense, yeah? Uh, in terms of content, this is the usual thing. I'm going to move very fast here. I think this is part of your pre-service education. You need to have deep knowledge of the sound system of the English language, the vocabulary, the morphology, the uh, syntax, the grammar, and also the uh, other four skills that you will be uh, teaching your students. The key word here you, is that you need to have deep knowledge about these content areas. Yet yeah, in the same way that a doctor will need to know you know, the anatomy of human body, I think you also need to have a deep knowledge of the language and how the language works actually. 
yeah, the different parts of the language and how the language works uh, when it is used for comprehension purposes or for production purposes like speaking and writing. I think this makes a lot of sense. Uh, let me move on very quickly. In terms of pedagogy, the same thing. You need to have deep pedagogical skills in all these areas. In the area of pronunciation, again, I think the tendency now is, as I said earlier, on, is not to spend a lot of time teaching your students to be able to speak like my friend George Whitehead here, for example. George, where are you from, George? Are you from the UK or from the US? I'm originally from Canada. Ah, she is from Canada, yes. But I've been in Korea for 15 years now, so I'm not sure that I still sound <laughs> yeah. as Canadian as I... Canadian I, accent, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the key point is you don't really have to acquire a Canadian accent, US accent, or UK accent, and things like that. Again, the key thing here is whether your pronunciation is easy to understand for people. Yeah, there may be some inaccuracies here and there, but as long as these inaccuracies does not impede comprehension, I think that should be okay. The same thing with knowledge about words. Very briefly, there are many, many, many words in the English language. As part of your pedagogical knowledge, I think you need to understand that people do not need that many words in order for them to be able to communicate fluently in that language. Researchers have found, for example, that you probably need about 1,000, 1,500 words. Let me say it again. About 1,000 to 1,500 words, or even 2,000 words maybe, for you to be able to express almost anything in the English language, almost anything in the English language, if and only if you know these 2,000 words really, really, really well. I think that it should be an important part of your pedagogical knowledge and skills. Let me say something about grammar as well, because this, this one is really, really important. For many years, we've been teaching grammar in a step-by-step -step manner, yeah? Believing that that is the way to go. We need to go from the easiest grammar to the more difficult, to the more complex grammar. And this will have to be taught very carefully, very systematically in an orderly fashion, like most of us are doing in the classroom. Surprise, surprise. That's not how we learn the language. That is not how language is acquired. If your focus is on helping your students pass the examination, go ahead, continue doing it in the same way. But if, if your goal, if your target is helping your students to be able to communicate, to use English for conversations, you know, for writing email messages, to do business in the English language, then that kind of grammar teaching is really, really out of place. Yeah, in fact, we'll be doing a lot of harm rather than good if we teach grammar in that way. However, having said that, the reality is lots of teachers in the world continue to be teaching grammar in that way, step by step, one after another. That is not how we learn grammar. That kind of grammar, by the way, is known as explicit grammar, which is good, useful a little bit, but not very useful when it comes to using the language for communication. Mm -hmm. Let me share with you a quote, a quote that I like very much. I think you should try to remember this quote, yeah? It's from an expert in second language acquisition. It says, the ability the ability to use language for communication depends heavily on implicit knowledge of the language. And that is exactly what we are not teaching our students because what we are teaching our students is known as explicit teaching of the rules, the conventions of the grammar of the English language. In addition to the, uh, these three language elements, I think we also need to understand really well the pedagogy, the most effective, successful pedagogy for teaching reading, for teaching writing, for teaching speaking, and for teaching listening as well. 
And that requires maybe another time for us to go through all the different ways of, you know, teaching, reading, writing, speaking, and listening based on recent uh, insights from the uh, professional literature. But later during the uh, Q&A, I think please feel free to ask me uh, questions re uh, related to the, uh, you know, pedagogical innovations for teaching uh, these language skills. Uh, the last one, still under professional uh, professionalism, is what is known as contextual knowledge. What a lot of people are learning uh, in school or at the university during their pre-service years is, you know, all the wonderful thing about grammar, vocabulary, how to teach reading skill and things like that. But the last bit of knowledge that is important, contextual knowledge can only be acquired the moment you start teaching. Yeah. Knowledge about the social and cultural context of English language teaching in that country will have to be, you know, we have to uh, be considered very carefully when you teach in the classroom. The uh, culture of the school, the culture or the curriculum uh, that is adopted by the uh, country or by the school. Uh, is another important consideration for you to take into uh, account. Whether you're, whether you're teaching ESP students, whether you're teaching uh, young children, teenagers, all this will have to be taken into account. You can't simply use whatever you learn at the university and apply you know, all these ideas without taking into account the contextual uh, variables that come into play. And finally, uh, the kind of learning resources that are available or not available uh, is another important consideration that you have to, you know, uh, pay attention to. So let me stop here for a while. That's number one. So idea number one is professional competence. The question for us is this, on a scale of one to 10, are you professionally competent? Please feel free to respond to this question. <laughs> you can turn on the audio and say, uh -huh. well, I'm still a five or I'm still a, uh -huh. you know, six. Above five, <laughs> seven, <laughs> 11. <laughs> okay. Seven, anyone else? Ah, seven. Yep. So think about this, not in terms of you, you like singular you, but in terms of you and your colleagues and your peers and the other mm -hmm. teachers in your country because one of the most important jobs for you as a language educator is for you to be able to also provide support to your peers, to the other uh, people in the uh, English language teaching community. Yep. So let me just move on now. So number one again is professional competence. As I said early on, this is a classic topic basically. Yeah, which is going to be very important whether we are living in this century in the next century or in the future? The same question has been asked, are we professionally competent? Mm -hmm. Moving on, the second one is quite straightforward. Again, this is another classic topic, mm -hmm. yeah, which is going to be important today and also tomorrow and also for many, many more years to come. Are you a reflective teacher? There are two things here that we need to, uh, you know, be aware of. Number one, I think we all agree that experience is important. There's a big difference between somebody who has had one year of teaching experience and somebody who has had five years of experience. Yeah, experience is important because that is how you can make sense of all the beautiful theories that you learn in school, at the university, and how that theories can, will have to be adjusted, will have to be, you know, tweaked in some way in order to uh, make it more relevant for your teaching situation. So experience is important, but there's another thing that is more important. It's what you do with that experience that is even more important. And that basically is what reflective person is all about. That is basically what reflection uh, is all about, reflecting on your experience. Now, here's the basis for uh, reflection. 
and later I'm going to ask you who says this. Learning is a continuous is a continuing process of constructing, that is learning, deconstructing, breaking it apart for you to make sense of that experience, and then putting, putting it back together, reconstructing that experience. And the process is continuous, the process is ongoing. That is what learning is all about. It has to be like that. Otherwise, the experience will just come and go. The experience won't stay very long in your head unless you are able to make sense of your experience by continuously reconstructing, deconstructing that experience in your head. Do you know who said this? Ajahn Yusuf. Ajahn Yusuf is my good friend from Pin Songkla University, Patani. Do you know who said this? Please say, I did. I just did. <laughs> it's not my idea. <laughs> It's, it's this guy's John idea. Dewey. I think, yes, John, John Dewey. Dewey. Everyone knows John Dewey. Yeah. He, is, he, he was considered the father of modern education, basically. Uh -huh. And many of his ideas are still being explored, still being yeah. studied, and still being you know, tried out in the classroom. And a lot of people actually build their career by you know, uh, extending or exploring uh, how John Dewey's ideas uh, are applicable in education, including in language education as well. Yeah. So the question of are you a reflective teacher requires that we try to make sense of our experience. When we look back, when we move forward, when we try to make sense of our experience, and when we reflect in action, when we reflect on action, and when we reflect for action. Now, these are things that you, you may have heard before. Continuous reflection as you are doing it or after you have done it, and the purpose of which is for you to become a better, more competent, more effective teacher. Yeah, looking back, looking forward. And there are a lot of tools that you can make use of. The easiest is just a small diary, a small teaching diary, for example. And you don't have to spend hours and hours writing on your diary. After you finish teaching, for example, or in my case, after I give this presentation, I think I'm going to look back and maybe take a few notes here and there. Oh, these are things that I shouldn't have said. Oh, these are things that I sh should have said more, for example. Just a small you know, time that is spent thinking back, reflecting. I think that would be a good thing for you to do. And you can do it alone. But the best thing for you to do will be to do it with other people. So it's always, always a good idea for you to have a critical friend. Somebody whom you can work with closely together. Somebody whom you want to grow together with. And somebody who will tell you honestly whether you are a good teacher, whether you are a struggling teacher, whether you are not a very good teacher, that somebody is what you need in order for you to grow. Uh, I took it from Google Image. I think this one is very useful for you, for us actually to, uh, you know, to uh, remember. Some practical ideas, for example, if you want to improve on your teaching, if you want to be able to reflect on your teaching, record yourself. It's very easy to do these days. You just need a video recording device. Yeah. And then at home, you look at it and ask yourself questions like, oh, why did I do that? How did my students respond to that question that I have? Yeah. If you want to do it with somebody else, then you can invite your colleagues, your critical friends to come and observe your class. If possible, identify the best teacher. Identify the best teacher in your school, in your institution, and invite that person to come and sit and watch you teach. And then listen to her or listen to him uh, for his feedback on your teaching. And please be ready to receive honest feedback from that person. And that is how we grow, actually. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Willie, yes. is it like peer coaching? Yes. yes. Yeah. If, yeah. If you're yeah. a junior, you know, yeah. If you're a junior colleague, then you need to work with somebody who is more senior, with, uh, you know, who is more senior, 
And uh, that person can coach you, can guide you, can provide you guidance and things like that. But if you have been around for 10 years and your teaching is still not up to scratch, not up to standard, then it's 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 about time that you need to you know develop you know this criticality, uh, reflectivity in your teaching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So these are yeah. all ideas that you can make use of to help you become more critical and more reflective. That is one excellent way. It's very cheap as well for you to grow. If and only if you are willing to grow. And today there's no reason for you not to grow. You have to become better. You have to become the best that you can be. Question for us. Again, please put your response in the chat box. Ajahn Mink, are you a would, reflective teacher? Do you have time yeah. to be reflective? Yes, I would say seven because almost yeah. everyone said seven for the last okay. question. Okay. Yeah. Yes. If you want to play safe, yes, give yourself a seven. Not too high. <laughs> Seven Not come number long. one. <laughs> yes. First ranking. Yeah, in my experience, I've 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 observed a lot of lessons, and my lesson has also been observed by other people. Mm. When I was young, when I was a junior teacher, I wasn't very happy when people came to my class. I felt insecure mm. and uh, sometimes a little bit embarrassed when I made mm. mistakes in my teaching. Mm -hmm. But now I'm more open, I'm more willing to listen to uh, people's comments about my teaching. Remember, you can only improve if people tell you your areas of weaknesses, okay. not your areas of strength. But of course, we all want to hear nice things, yeah? <laughs> hey, I'm a very good teacher. I'm, 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 you know, I'm the best teacher in the school. Mm -hmm. That will not help you grow. Uh, professionally number three <clears throat> another very important uh, concept uh, in the 21st century as I said student-centered teaching is not new it's been around for many many years but unfortunately not many people have embraced this idea holistically or fully yet I think it's about time the embrace student-centered teacher or student-centered teaching today. The reason is very straightforward. People listen very carefully and see if you agree with me. We, the teachers, are no longer the sole source of knowledge for our students. Even our school is no longer the only place where the students can get knowledge and information. Even the library is no longer the place for people to you know, acquire knowledge and information. Today is the internet. The internet has vast store of knowledge that can be accessed 24 hours a day. And as a teacher, as a 21st century teacher, I think we have to leverage on that. We have to make use of that wealth of knowledge and information, and we need to teach our students to do that. And that is possible when we stop spending a lot of time lecturing in the classroom. So in terms of teaching, I think we need to learn how to reduce the amount of teaching, maybe by 50% or even more, so that the students have a lot more opportunities to explore, to spend time looking at, finding, identifying, screening, you know, uh, information from the internet, from basically from Google. And some people have said this, I don't know if you agree or not. If students can find the information on Google, I think there's no point for you to teach it. It's true to some extent, yeah? But there are other skills that you have to teach your students. It's the skill of managing information, the skill of identifying, selecting, evaluating information. That is what we need to teach but not the knowledge itself. Yeah. Student-centered teaching is closely associated with the idea that it is the students who do the learning. The teachers do the teaching, the students do the learning. They don't correlate, unfortunately. What we teach may not be what the students learn. 
And because of that, we need to engage the students so well that they get an opportunity to learn more in the classroom under our guidance, under our supervision. So the key word here is learner engagement. If you are looking for the trend today in terms of education, not only in language education, but in any other education, it's learner engagement. How engaged are your students? How many of your students are engaged when you are teaching? Because students today, George, I think you will agree with me, students today are very good. You know, they are actually sleeping with their eyes open. <laughs> they're actually taking a break, you know, with their eyes open. They're pretending to be listening to you, but they're not because their minds are elsewhere, because they're not engaged, basically. And some people have suggested, this is based on, you know, some research that I've seen, uh, you know, some years back, that effective teachers, professional teacher, professionally effective teachers are able to engage 90% of the students, 90% of the time. So that is one characteristic of, if you ask me, a 21st century uh, teacher, 21st century language teacher, being able to engage almost everyone uh, in the classroom. But when you say engage, that's a tricky word. That's a very loaded word. What do we mean by engagement? I think researchers have identified at least four areas that you can focus on when you're thinking about engaging your students. Effectively, emotionally, Cognitively, kinesthetically, movement, and also socially through collaboration, discussion, uh, group activities, and things like that. So very briefly, in our teaching, if we truly want to engage our students, we need to care about their feeling. The emotional needs will have to be addressed first and foremost. There's no point in you spending you know, half an hour or one hour teaching your students if your students are not feeling curious. Because a lot of what you say, a lot of what you teach will just, you know, uh, be, it will just be filtered out by your students because they are not there. They are not with you. They are not engaged. So ask yourself these questions. Are my students curious about the uh, lesson that I'm doing? If not, find out why not. Maybe next time around, you should change your materials. Yeah, and find materials that are really making your students feel very curious, excited about the content. But at the same time, we also want to make sure that the students are feeling emotionally safe in the classroom so that they can ask questions without feeling uh, afraid of making mistakes, without feeling afraid of being ridiculed because the question may be considered stupid questions. There's nothing like stupid questions. Yeah, learning happens when you ask questions, actually, any kind of questions. And these questions may sound stupid initially, but these questions may turn out to be an important springboard for you to explore, you know, uh, deeper level kind of questions. In terms of thinking, we want our students to be doing all these wonderful things related to thinking. Yeah, connecting, making connections between ideas, uh, synthesizing information, analyzing information, exploring, comparing, contrasting. Now, this is where you need to bring in the internet. The Google is excellent here to help the students to do the exploration and to help the students to extend whatever they learn in the classroom. We can't provide all the possible you know, pieces of knowledge in the classroom. We need to allow students to explore, to empower them, to, you know, <clears throat> to make use of what is available on the internet. Just give me one second. <clears throat> the last one is, the next one is doing, kinesthetic. Sitting, sitting, listening, and thinking for half an hour can be very tiring, and the students get bored very quickly. So this is when you need to provide students with opportunities to discuss, to debate, to move about, to create maybe infographics or other things uh, that the students can you know, do uh, in the classroom. In other words, some doing will become uh, very important as well. 
And finally, we should not forget the social needs of the students. Surprise, surprise, students are just like us. We enjoy working with other people. So are, you know, so do our students. They also enjoy learning with and from their peers as well. So group discussion, collaborative learning activities become a very important part of student-centered uh, education or student-centered learning. Uh, another dimension, which is related to what I said earlier on about engagement, is practical knowledge that teachers must have about how to motivate our students in the classroom. And there are many things that we can do, and I'm going to share with you five things here. Yeah, these are five things that you are very familiar with, five things that you, you know, that you do almost every day. Uh, the first one is the teacher, you. Now keep asking yourself whether you are a motivating teacher, whether you are a likable teacher, whether you are a, an authentic teacher, whether you are an enthusiastic teacher. The teacher is a source of motivation, is a great source of motivation uh, among your students. Uh, tier number two is the way you teach. Do you teach in the same way day in, day out, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and so on? Or do you employ a variety of teaching methods in the classroom? Yeah, the answer should be, you know, that you should be in, uh, using different uh, varieties of teaching methods. Otherwise, the students will get tired and lose their interest. Tier number three is the teaching materials. I think I mentioned this early on, that your teaching materials will have to be emotionally uh, engaging, it will have to be cognitively uh, interesting as well. T number four is the task. Yeah, think about the task. Keep asking these questions. If you're not very sure, ask your students. Are the tasks that I've been giving you interesting, motivating, engaging, or not? And finally, the test. Now, the test is probably the most difficult, yeah, for you to make it more motivating. But today, people are talking about assessment for learning, not just assessment of learning, but people are talking about assessment for learning. The idea is that we make use of assessment procedures in order to help our students, in order to support our students, in order to help our students to identify their areas of weaknesses and their areas of strengths. In other words, formative assessment is a big thing now. Again, this is something that is, you know, gaining traction recently, that we should focus more on smaller and more frequent uh, tests rather than one big test at the end of the semester or at the end of the year. Colleagues, friends, are you a student-centered teacher? <laughs> Please answer this question. Yes. Yes. <laughs> now we are recording your answers. Don't worry. <laughs> I think the answer is we should be or we should become more student-centered. It's not easy to make that change. But I think the moment we start thinking about our students, yeah, the way they learn, mm -hmm. the kind of activities that will engage them emotionally and cognitively, I think you are in the right direction there. So stop thinking about you giving a beautiful presentation, beautiful lecture in the classroom. Mm -hmm. It's not a bad thing, but that is not how we learn. I think we know that very well. Students learn when they are fully engaged, when they are able to think, explore, extend, elaborate, and mm -hmm. also evaluate their own learning. I think that's the most powerful form of learning that can happen in the classroom. And that is only possible when we adopt this pedagogy known as a student-centered pedagogy, yeah. Number four. Uh, Ajahn Lili. Yes. Uh, uh, from yes, Ajahn Yusuf. Yeah. Yes, from, yes, from, yes. I mean, uh, teaching a student is 
it's good. I mean, it, it's really good indeed, actually. But yeah. it always in, in, in some classes, for example, as we are aware that in even class, there are many group of students and they are very diverse. Of mm. course, some of them, they are very active and they prefer to be like active learners. Yes. So, I mean, providing the um, a student center activities or, or assessment, I mean, okay, that's fine for them. But it always, there are some, some group of students, maybe like a minority in the class. Yeah. They, may, they, prefer, they prefer to be like a passive learners. Mm. So, uh, no matter how many, you know, uh, yes. we provide them like a, a different types of tasks or yep. you know, activity, they still, oh, I just like it. I just, mm. I just want to listen to you and you are, I would like you to feed us as the, as the, yep. as the, uh, yeah, as the knowledge. So, in that yep. case, uh, based on your experience, yes. you have any idea how to tackle with, I mean, to, to those, mm. to tackle with those students or how to increase their, their motivation regarding, you know, uh, learning English. Mm. And that's all we have yes. in class. It's a, it's a very good question, uh, Ajahn Yusuf. I think the answer is rather obvious. Uh, if you find it difficult, if we find it difficult to change from being a teacher-centered you know, person to becoming a learner-centered you know, teacher, uh, students will also find it difficult. I think they need time to adjust. They need time to understand why uh, being more active, being more involved in the learning process is important. But slowly, gradually, I think they will understand. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, we may not be able to get every single person to enjoy, you know, the more active uh, form of learning. I think we have to appreciate that. And yeah. because of that, another important idea that I've heard recently, that is again, you know, gaining a lot of traction, is the idea of differentiated instruction, DI, differentiated instruction, where the idea actually is very simple, but at the same time, very powerful. What DI means basically is that when we teach, we should not come to class with a single package, one lesson, one reading passage, one activities, one set of questions for everyone. Your DI requires that we provide, for example, in a reading lesson, instead of using one single reading passage, we make it possible for the students to choose maybe one out of three or four that we have put together in our lesson package. I know it's very tricky. We are not used to doing this, but that is an important part of embracing a student-centered pedagogy. Yeah, the way we explain can also be different. Sometimes uh, we take a center stage and giving a lecture, giving a lot of explanation, but that should not be the only way because your students are different. Some students enjoy listening to us, but some other students enjoy more hands-on activities. So again, we have to be ready to explore different ways, or even in a single lesson, we may want to use different ways of you know, delivering our lesson in the classroom using different ways of teaching. The same thing with assessment. Yeah. Usually we only use one form of assessment and usually that assessment is verbal. Students have to write answers, either multiple choice or verbal responses <clears throat> to our questions. But today the thinking is different. We are thinking about diversity. Our students are different. And because of that, they have to be assessed differently as well. Verbally, sometimes kinesthetically, and sometimes, you know, digitally, and using other forms of assessment. But again, Ajahn Yusuf, I'm not saying it's easy to do, but this is the trend that people are now exploring. I think people in Singapore, for example, teachers in Singapore are encouraged to explore DI, differentiated instruction. And people are struggling because they're not used to it. I think you and me, we, are, we have gotten used to preparing one single lesson, one way of doing it, one way of teaching it, and one way of assessing our students. But I think we need to change. Yeah, mm -hmm. it won't happen overnight, but I think gradually we will be able to, you know, provide, the keyword is to provide more choices in the classroom. Mm -hmm more choices for the students to learn in the best possible mode of learning mm -hmm. for them. 
not easy, but this is something, this is the direction that a lot of people are going into mm -hmm. these days. Okay, very briefly, I think as you may have expected, you know, today we can't run away from the uh, digital technology and the expectation is for us to be able to make use of the uh, digital technology for our teaching, for communication purposes, and also for other purposes. I have four things that I want to share with you very briefly. In terms of tech tools, yes, there are a lot out there. Some are more useful than others. Some are easier to use than others. Some you have to pay and some other you don't have to pay. As a 21st century teacher, you simply have to use some of them, but you need to be very choosy. You need to be very careful. Choose maybe five, maybe six tools that are easy to use, number one. And number two, tools that support your teaching. Remember that technology does not improve teaching. Technology does not improve learning. It is the way we use technology that can improve uh, you know, student learning in the classroom. These are just examples of four very simple, very easy to use you know, tech tools that I've used myself. Number one is Peer Deck. If you, have, if you don't know what Peer Deck is, I don't have to teach you. I don't have to explain what it is. You just go to Google or you go to YouTube. And that's how I learned uh, that this application actually existed. Peer Deck. If you want to make your PowerPoint slides interactive, that is the application that you might want to use. Freely available. Yeah, but you have to create your PowerPoint slides using uh, Google Slides. So maybe let's say that you have 30 PowerPoint slides, for example, every fifth slide, you can add peer deck, you can add questions, you can add discussion, you know, uh, questions for the students to spend time maybe writing, thinking about the issue before they look at the uh, following slides and so on. Very useful stuff. Wakelet, <clears throat> very useful. If you're doing flip classroom, Wakelet can be a very simple, easy to use, freely available tool that you can use. So basically this is an online interactive cabinet available for you to use for free, completely free. They never charge you unless the owner is different in the future, but at the moment it's completely free. The next one is Padlet, another very popular application. Yeah, very useful. If you want to engage students in more active uh, interaction and collaboration in the classroom, that's the way to go. Flipgrid is just a video recording device. Uh, it has some interactive feature as well, freely available for you to use. Yeah. Again, the key thing to remember is we have to use technology, whether during the pandemic or after the pandemic. Technology is going to stay with us and we simply have to make use of uh, technology in our teaching. The reason is very simple. Our students are users of technologies. They have become used to using technologies, so they will not be too happy if you teach them without uh, technology. Yeah, being digitally literate means that you need to know the uh, different ways, different conventions, different culture of communicating using you know the many many tools that are available, many many media that are available these days. Yeah. One of the most useful, perhaps, if you ask me, and, and, and another important tool that we will be using a lot in the future is video. So you have the uh, logo of YouTube there, yeah? Video. I think increasingly, increasingly, or maybe in the future, we'll be using a lot of video-based materials for teaching purposes in the classroom and also asynchronously uh, outside the classroom, providing students with video-based materials for the students to, you know, to learn from before they come to you in the classroom. Uh, I'm referring to the flipped classroom situation here. Yeah. Again, the key word here is communication and collaboration. You, you need to learn how to use the uh, digital technology for these purposes, for communication and for collaboration. I think all of you know this, yeah? Uh, Ajahn Wee what is this symbol? PowerPoint slide, yeah? Yes, 
Yes, PowerPoint slides. Yeah. Yes, is. and we use PowerPoint slides for what? Uh, when we have lecture, when we teach, yes. normally yes. we use my, yes. my favorite was power, uh, PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> and now I try to use Canvas, <laughs> try okay. to learn. <laughs> yes, there are many different you know, tools that you can use. But the key yeah. thing is that we are using this tool for what? To communicate. Communicate, yeah? yes. To pass on or to mm -hmm. deliver information to other mm -hmm. people. The question for us is, have we been using mm -hmm. this effectively? Have we been using this important tool uh, effectively remember the name of this tool is power points but what we see happening very often i'm going to show you some examples of slides sometimes uh, I'm, so boring, right? <laughs> I'm so sorry i should have removed the name please don't look at the names <laughs> <laughs> sorry you know I, I i i block off the name of the presenters there oh yeah the name of the presenters are blocked off so those mm -hmm. are the names of the authors of the okay. article that the uh, maybe the two students are presenting. Mm -hmm. Please tell me. I'm going to show you, you know, two or three different slides from mm -hmm. the same uh, group of people. Please tell me whether the slides are nice. There you go. Whoa. Problem. Problem. Yes. Too Problem? much content. Problem. Yes. Too much information. <laughs> See, even a simple PowerPoint slides, you know, a lot of people have been abused, misusing it, not abusing, misusing PowerPoint slides. Remember, PowerPoint slide must contain points, powerful points, but these are not powerful points. This is just text. Remember, when you use PowerPoint slides, you are using PowerPoint slides, not for you, but for your audience. We want our audience to be able to follow, you know, uh, our session, the information that we're presenting. So the PowerPoint slide should not be distracting uh, students' attention. And I hope you can immediately see comparing these slides with my slides. My slides are very nicely yes. designed. Yes. And it took me forever. <laughs> you, you think it's very easy to create PowerPoint slides, you know, mm. like this one. It takes me forever because I need to be very selective. I need to make sure that I mention only powerful points that I want to get across. I rarely, if ever, use sentences. Paragraphs, no, no. You don't put a, you know, a whole paragraph on your PowerPoint slides. Yeah. So the next part about digital literacy is this. Very important. Remember, there's a lot of information, even too much information out there. 50 years ago, when I was younger, there was not that much information. But now we are flooded. We are immersed with a lot of information. What we need to do as an educator, as a language educator, is to help the students to find information on the internet, on Google. More importantly, we need to teach our students how to select useful information and lastly the most important is how we can help our students to filter to evaluate information yeah we've been teaching our students about criticality critical reading critical listening and things like that but this you know are the kind of things that we need to be doing helping students to identify whether the information is credible whether the information is trustworthy whether the uh, source of the information is from reliable uh, you know, parties and things like that. And finally, it's managing information. I think you will, uh, you can appreciate the importance of this, uh, the last skill of managing information. You know, what sort of, of information you want to keep in your hard drive or in the cloud, for example, because storage is going to be an issue very soon. We, nowadays, we are looking at gigabytes, yeah, hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes. When I was a student, I put all my thesis in a very small <laughs> floppy disk, <laughs> maybe only 20 or maybe 30K kilobyte. But today it's like, you know, one megabyte is not enough. And then the problem of re retrieval as well. So these are things that we need. It's an important part of our, you know, uh, new literacy skill called digital uh, literacy. Again, I think you need to 
try to assess yourself on a 10 point scale, whether you are truly, truly digitally literate. We are all moving towards, you know, the higher end of the uh, scale. Yes. But I think many of us are still maybe in a five, six, seven yeah, uh, kind still, of ballpark figure. Yes. Yeah. Our chat box is very active, <laughs> Dr. Willie, very because, yes, thank you very, very much, you know. <laughs> yes. Uh, two more to go, yeah? yeah. If you have Another, any questions, yes. maybe keep it, okay? And, yes, uh, or, or at you, the can end. Pop, yes? you can pop the uh, question at any time. Okay. I'm very happy to be Okay. Uh, interrupted. Mm. I think that's an important part of uh, having yeah. a session like this. If I speak too long, you know, things will get forgotten very quickly. Yeah. Uh, lifelong learner. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a nice quote that I saw recently in the Harvard Business Review, that lifelong learning actually is not just good, it's extremely good for you. It's good for your health. You become healthier mentally active, yeah, mentally engaged as well. And you become wealthier because if you know a lot of skills, if you have acquired a lot of knowledge, I think chances are very high that you'll be yeah, able to get a better job. If, if you're now teaching at Patani and you want to go to Bangkok, I think it becomes easier if you can show people that you have acquired you know, a new set of uh, knowledge and skill and also for your personal, social, and professional development. So lifelong learning is good. Lifelong learning means learning forever, that learning never stops. Yeah, I think you're familiar with this. Lifelong learning is learning forever, basically, until the time that you are tired of living in this world, then that's where you stop learning. Yeah two or three important aspects of lifelong learning that we need to be aware of is life deep learning, specializing, going deeper into uh, an area. Uh, Ajahn Ming, for example, uh, is exploring, uh, you know, a research idea for her thesis, and yes. she is going deeper into the area of listening. Yes. So that's going deep, basically, yeah? Extensive just, just, listening. Yeah, extensive listening. That's just, just an example of how we can go deep into one area so that we become better, we become more knowledgeable about that particular area. You know, some of you may be exploring grammar or pronunciation or other aspects of language learning. Life-wide, the idea is very interesting, actually. Yeah. Uh, the idea that we can also learn from other areas of education for other areas of you know, different industries, for example. So we should not be living in a silo thinking that, well, English language education is very specialized. You, know, you just need to learn everything about linguistics, applied linguistics, social linguistics, and that's it. I don't think that's true. I think we can learn from people doing other things uh, in other industries, the legal system, the uh, business area, for example. In business, for example, you know, one big topic in business is for people to be more communicative and more persuasive. Business people are very good at persuading other people to buy their products, yeah? Do teachers need to be persuasive? I think so. I think because, so. Yes, yeah. because in a sense, in the classroom, we are selling a product, right? Yeah. <laughs> so we need to be persuasive. We need to make sure that your students are feeling the need to learn uh, from you. And finally, perhaps the most important thing is life wise. As you grow older, I think you should become wiser. You know, being able to accept things that, that, that don't always go your way, being able to deal with, you know, things that in the past, you know, give you a hard time. But as you grow older, you should be able to embrace life, to accept things as they are, for example. Yeah. So life-wise is probably the final goal of a lifelong learner. Another important point in the uh, lifelong journey that you may be experiencing is for you to be willing to learn, not only to learn new things, which is very important, but also to unlearn, to unpack and unlearn things 
that probably worked in the past, but today it may not work anymore. You need to be willing to unlearn that. Yeah. And then maybe in the process, you need to relearn things. I think I give you an example early on, the way we teach grammar. If you ask me, if you want me to be really, really honest and upfront with you, I think the way we teach grammar is incorrect, is wrong. The step-by-step uh, -step teaching, the uh, systematic explanation, elaborate explanation of grammar points in school, for example, is just not the kind of thing that we should be doing because that goes contrary to what researchers on, and our experiences have found about the process of language acquisition. Yeah, so be willing to learn, relearn, and unlearn things that we have learned in the past. Again, question for us, are we a lifelong learner? I hope the answer is yes. If you feel that, well, I'm already 50 years old, or I'm already 60 years old, I think I, it's about time that I stop learning. I think you are completely mistaken. Let me give you an example. There's a guy, a scientist by the name of Dr. Goodenough. Now, the name is very interesting, George. Dr. Goodenough. I think you can Google him later, yeah? When he was 90, was it last year or the year before? I think he won Nobel Prize. When he was 90 years old, Nobel Prize for what? <clears throat> for inventing battery. The kind of battery that you, you're using for your mobile phones and things like that. The guy's name is Dr. Goodenough. I think he was the co-winner of the Nobel Prize last year with another scientist, if I'm not mistaken, from Japan. And he was 90 years old. And that means he is somebody who is testimony to the importance of lifelong uh, learning. Uh, many of you may think that I'm a young person. I'm not. I'm getting there. Not 90 yet, but I'm getting there. But I'm, I enjoy learning. And I will keep on learning until that day when I have to say goodbye to you and to other people in the country. The last one. The last one. I hope this, this, this last point will be an inspiration for all of us. And I would encourage all of you to watch a video by this psychologist. And the name of the psychologist from the US is Angela Duckworth. And she introduced the term grit, and this is the video. I'm sorry. Uh, she says that grit is perhaps the strongest predictor for success. And I'm sure all of you here are aspiring to be more successful in your career, to become a better teacher, to become a professionally competent teacher, and that is success. And for that success to happen, according to her at least, you need to be gritty. And I'll explain to you what gritty is all about. This is the video from YouTube. I think you need to spend time watching this video, only, only about six minutes long. And I hope that video will change the way you look at things, that the way you understand success. Success, according to her, is this. Step number one, you need to develop a skill, whatever it is, teaching skill, maybe. Yeah. And for that, you need some talent, plus you need to put in effort. You need to try, you need to work on it, you need to spend time developing uh, your skill. But that is not enough. If you want to become a very skillful teacher, then you need to put in more effort. Look at that. So effort is what counts when it comes to success in your life, success in your career. Effort, effort, effort. It's not intelligence. It's not your social background. It's not your cultural background, but it's your determination. It is your effort, the amount of time, the amount of effort that you put in. Uh, Angela Duckworth has also written a book, and the book is called Grit. And I would encourage you to all read that book. And in that book, he, she explains very clearly the uh, important ingredients, elements of a gritty person. Number one, you need to have a sense of purpose. 
yeah, the purpose in relation to you, yourself. I want to become a better person. I want to become a more successful teacher, but that is not enough. The other one is purpose for the good of other people. In other words, you want to become better because you want to serve other people. Now, in our case, in education, we want to make a difference to our students' life. That is the most powerful purpose. Yeah, if you have that purpose in place, then the next bit is passion. Are you a passionate teacher? Are you a passionate educator? If the answer is yes, 100%, then the next element will start to kick in. That is perseverance. That is where effort comes in. That is where you will never, never give up. In your effort, in your attempt to become a better, more competent 21st century language teacher. Yeah. If we add another component, it's known as growth mindset. Now, this is an idea that was developed by uh, Dweck. What's the somebody Dweck? I can't remember the first name. Another professor in psychology from the US. I think she is essentially saying that we need to have growth mindset. If you have growth mindset and if you have a very clearly defined purpose, passion, and also perseverance, I think nothing can stop you. You become more successful, you become a better person, you become a better teacher, and you'll be able to become the best that you can be. Growth mindset. Never give up, basically, because you believe in yourself, because you believe that you can grow. Unlike those people who have fixed mindset, they keep on saying, no, I can't do this. No, I'm not good enough. I'm from a small town. I'm, you know, I'm from a small, poor family, for example. Uh, what I am doing now is good enough. You know, if you ask me to do more things, well, that's way too hard for me. I don't want to do it. That, you know, those are what people with fixed mindset will be saying to you. And, and, and Ajahn, really from my experience, I found lots of people when they were asked to do something, one of the main excuses, they always say that, oh, it's not my passion. Yeah. Yes. If you are in education, and if you say that you don't have that passion in education, I think you should stop becoming an educator because okay. it, will be, it will be torture for you. Mm -hmm. Because in education, yeah. what is most important is that you want to make an important contribution, mm -hmm. a difference in other people's life. And that is what yes. an educator is all about. So being gritty means somebody with a very strong passion, with a very clearly defined purpose, you know, and uh, somebody who is willing to put in a lot of effort in order to become better in whatever they're doing in their career or in their life. Mm -hmm. So are you a gritty teacher? I hope the answer is, mm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. <laughs> Ajahn Ming, are you a gritty teacher? <laughs> Hopefully, yes. Hopefully, yes. yes. So ladies and gentlemen, finally, let me share with you the six yes. ideas again. Yeah, yes. these are six ideas that I think will yeah. help you define whether you are a 21st mm -hmm. language teacher, mm -hmm. professionally competent, reflective teacher, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, adopting student-centered mm -hmm. pedagogy, digitally literate, mm -hmm. lifelong learner, and also a gritty gritty person with that i end my presentation and i'm mm -hmm. going to invite you to ask questions and to also mm -hmm. add other elements that you think are important mm -hmm. for us to consider if we truly truly want to become a 21st century uh, language teacher ajan we monat okay. yes to you okay <laughs> thank you Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Willy, for your knowledge contribution. So I'm sure that today we have gained a lot of knowledge about the characteristics of 21st century English language teachers, right? Mm. And to me, your presentation and lecture opened our eyes to see what are exactly the main and the important characteristics of uh, the uh, 21st century for English language teacher and how much is important for us as a teacher to 
improve to adapt or to you know have a growth mindset let's say <laughs> for our teaching you know and to uh, our participant now it's time for q a session mm. so welcome for all questions either mm. in the chat box or from the microphone you can turn on your microphone right away yes and yes please I, feel free to ask questions i would like to invite my new friend from kl kuala lumpur yeah. i was talking to her earlier today okay you are invited now <laughs> yun are you still there yun Yun from KL. Dr. Yun. I think she's, think she's <laughs> gone. Uh, I, I think she has a meeting. Okay, other questions, please. <clears throat> I think she'll be back. Hello. Uh, hello. Yes, hello, yes. Pro hello, doc Dr. Willy. Basir is speaking from Afghanistan. Okay. Ah, my old friend from Afghanistan. <laughs> I met him some 10 years ago in Singapore. <laughs> Yeah, so because of you, now I'm able to speak in English. Mm -hmm. Now I'm able to write uh, research mm -hmm. papers in English. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So, yeah, thank you so much. God may bless you. Yes, please come again to Singapore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, sure. It, Singapore is very, you know, costly country. So it, it's, it's, it's quite difficult for me to, to go there and study. But I, I hope so. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, doctor, I, uh, I have done some training on reflective teaching. Yes. Uh, with Indiana University, uh, which was mm. fantastic. And uh, it was actually it had two part, part A, part B. So I did part A and then I was not able to do part B. But a student mm. center, a student center learning is, is still a challenge for us here in Afghanistan yeah. due to a number of reasons. First, mm. a number of a number of students in the class and lack of resources. Yeah. So I would like to have your point of view mm. in large classes and especially in, in classes with with low what is it, lack of resources. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Two points. Number one is large classes. Number two is resources. The second one is easier, actually, because in terms of resources, what you need is just, you know, a gadget, a computer, a laptop, and connection to the internet. And the resources are all there on the internet, on Google. Your job as a teacher, I think, is to provide students, helping students to identify what sources, what websites, what learning channels. Uh, should your students be, you know, accessing and how they should go about, you know, selecting and evaluating the uh, information that is available on the internet. So the second one actually is not a big deal. Uh, 50 years ago, yes. If you don't, if you did not have 50 years ago, if you did not have resources, that means you did not have resources, full stop. Yeah, but today I think the uh, resources are there available on the internet on the internet if you're looking for reading materials for example hundreds thousands of free reading materials are available on the internet if you need listening materials again hundreds thousands of listening materials are available large classes okay this is very important large classes is something that is beyond your control i don't think you can do a lot in terms of making changes to large classes what you can do is for us or for you to pay attention to things that you that are within your control remember the five t's that i mentioned early on five t's i think you need to work on your personality your characteristic as a teacher t number one because t number one is probably the most important thing but very often underutilized by the teacher yeah if the teacher is inspiring, if the teacher is seen as being very likable by the, by the students, I think chances are higher that the students will want to learn with you, although the uh, classes are, you know, have limited resources and things like that. And then you can also look at the other uh, T's that I shared with you early on, because those are things that are within your control. The teaching materials, the teaching methodology, the tasks and activities, 
and also the tests that you can use. Class size, you cannot change. The gender of your students, you cannot change. Leave them alone. Yeah. If you find that you're not very happy with large classes and with the number of male or female students that you have in your classes, you're extremely unhappy, there's one thing that you can do. Get another thank job. You, thank you so much. <laughs> really appreciate it. Uh, may yeah. I have a request? Okay. Thank you. My, yes, my phone number. I will send no, my email, phone email, number. Email, <laughs> email, email, email address. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yes. Thank you. That's it. Okay. So we have. Uh, I found one question from the chat box. May I read it? Okay. Yes, please. What What is your suggestion to reinforce many Thai burnout teachers to be the gritty teacher? This is from Kun Kanit. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Burnout is really an issue. Uh, mm -hmm. If you teach at the university level, every now and then you can take a break. You can take mm -hmm. leave actually. Uh, there's a special leave called sabbatical leave. Mm -hmm. And that yes. is an opportunity for you to, you know, look at things in another place, mm -hmm. uh, you know, explore new things in different places, or just take a break from your teaching. Yeah. But if you're a school teacher, that may be a little bit difficult for you to take a break from. And the best thing you can do is to form a community of teachers, yeah. maybe a small one, maybe comprising five yeah. of your colleagues. And uh, you can meet, you know, regularly. Uh, you can share your experiences. You can share your frustrations. I think that's one way for you to sort of motivate each other mm -hmm. to stay in the business, mm -hmm. to be more, you know, uh, motivated again. I think that's mm -hmm. the best advice that I can give you. Yeah. If you are really, really burnt out because you, you can't mm -hmm. really fit in with the culture of the school, yes. Or the mm -hmm. university then the best mm -hmm. thing for you will be to find an to find a new job to relocate yeah. elsewhere mm -hmm. yeah which is probably what happened to me because i mm -hmm. spent 10 years in one place and after a while i feel that i mm -hmm. you know i won't be able to... uh we cannot hear your voice yes because you okay, okay. because you muted me oh, that's why who who <laughs> somebody <laughs> mute you not me <laughs> yes ah okay yes. thank you for the answer yes and i i uh, during your presentation during the lecture i found that uh, a number of participants were request about the uh, the file, the powerpoint your presentation uh, yes. fine so yes. can we got this? regarding the yes. file, we are planning yeah. to spend by the end of this session actually yes huh. if you don't I have it yes. if you don't have it by now please blame ajan yusuf okay because i sent my powerpoint slides ah. two hours ago to ah. him <laughs> okay i'm but, planning to send at the end of the section yes session. at the end of our, our <laughs> session because you need we, we are uh, we i like you everybody to yeah. fill the form the evaluation form first and of course 100 percent Adam, you, one, right? can can yes. I have a question before you go to the evaluation? Form? Yes, for sure, for sure. We need yeah, some because some, I really some need questions. you know some you know perspective from Dr. Willy. Yes, so, sir. Uh, uh, currently, we are facing you know one of the uh, challenging you know dimension of mm -hmm. our learners. It is yes. about the diverse backgrounds of learners. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say about the diverse in terms of language ability. Of, of English itself and yes. you know, diverse of motivation of learning mm. and language skill and even learning preference and of course about the access to to the to the uh, you know digital gadget like for example laptop and i yes. and phone and, and stuff like that so in our class for example in a one in our class there's about 30 students in our class yes. and so we have such kind of diverse of learners in our class, and and then mm. we are as a teachers. How can we deal with those problem with, with those uh, challenges in order yeah. to teach our lesson to be effective? You know, uh, teachers, as you mentioned, you know, set six you know characteristics for the effective teachers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for your question, Ajahn Bodin. Uh, can I ask you if you have heard of this idea called extensive reading? or extensive listening. Now, these are approaches that we can try to use uh, in our teaching. Mm -hmm. And if you do it consistently with your students for maybe one year, I think you will be able to more or less equalize 
equalize your students in terms of their English language proficiency. So the name again is extensive reading or extensive listening. Now these two approaches of language learning are based on the idea that students can choose what they want to listen and what they want to read. So choice is there. Yeah, since choice is there, then you are already overcoming the issue of diversity. Yeah, we cannot get rid of diversity. The only thing that we can do, or one of the most important, one of the most, you know, one of the uh, things that we can do is to provide students with choices. And extensive reading and listening is about giving students choices. And with choices uh, come students' motivation. Yeah because choice and motivation are very much related. If the students can choose what they want to read and what they want to view, what they want to listen to, then their motivation will also uh, increase. In other words, we are also trying to equalize the other important element of motivation, because we know for a fact that the students are differently motivated. Some are more motivated than others. Now, if you provide that choices in a reading program or in a listening program, then you are dealing with that. Yeah, but the key thing to remember is this, you need to have materials available for your students, diverse materials. You cannot just use one form of materials for everyone in the classroom. You need to have, you need to use different materials. Is it easy to make available different set of materials for your students? The answer is yes, it is easy now. In the past, it wasn't easy. But today it's very, very easy. You can explore the internet for different types of reading and listening materials. Or if you have some money, I would suggest that you subscribe, that you sign up, you subscribe to a digital library of graded readers called X Reading. Mm -hmm. You may not have heard about X Reading, but X Reading is used in a number of schools and universities in Thailand. Uh, Shulalongkorn University Language Institute used that program two years ago for the whole cohort of first year students. And then there's another university. Uh, it used to be a Rajabat University. Ming, do you remember the name of that university? It's a Rajabat University uh, somewhere near Bangkok. I can't remember the name. That university has been using X reading for the past three years. And that is how you can address the uh, different diversity. Uh, needs of your students but at the same time at the same time more importantly you will be able to see significant improvement in your students English language proficiency isn't that all you know the kind of thing that we want to happen in our students that our students become better users of English not only good in examination but also being able to use English for you know, work-related purposes in the future when they graduate from your uni university. Again, I've been saying about extensive reading and listening because these are two evidence-based approaches that have been shown consistently by research and also by own experience to be the most powerful, if you ask me, the most powerful approaches to language acquisition, to language development is reading, listening, and viewing. But you have to do this every day, every single day, making sure that you can spend at least 20 to 30 minutes every day. One of the reasons, I'm going to say it in a very simple word, one of the reasons our students do not speak English or do not write in English very well is simply because they haven't heard enough English. They haven't seen enough English. That is the most important reason why the students are not very good at speaking and writing. They have not seen enough English and they have not heard enough English. That's all. I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm simplifying things, but, but that is the most important uh, you know, uh, reasons that we have not addressed adequately in our teaching. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Willy. And I thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. contact to Ajahn Ming from Jolong mm -hmm. Yes, Ajahn Ming is an expert on extensive listening. Invite her <laughs> to give a workshop or something. Yes. Yeah, we Thank will. Thank you, Ajahn.
Okay. I think now we are running out of time, right? So that's all for Q&A session. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, so now and before we end our session not, uh, today. I don't actually yes. we still have lots of uh, time, yes, about 20 yes. minutes ago. Uh, uh -huh. Adani, I, I have some questions, actually. Oh, okay, you have more questions. Okay. Actually, I, I, I like the uh, one uh, part okay. that you have just mentioned that uh, teaching, uh, the way we teach grandma nowadays is not uh -huh. in the right track. Um, I am quite agree because I have discussed this with, with lots of my students and mm -hmm. it seems like the aspect of the grandma that teacher teach in the classroom sometimes it's like a once in a blue moon we use in our daily life situation. So uh, do you have any suggestion or any resources where we can reference how to teach grandma, you know, uh, correctly step by step? Okay. Uh, I think what you need to do is to not teach grammar explicitly. Mm -hmm. Maybe focus on the most important, basic, most yes. useful grammatical features in the English language. And that's it. Mm -hmm. A kind of grammar that the students need in order for them to be able to understand spoken language and written language. That's all. The rest, the more complicated, the more sophisticated, the more complex grammatical features like the mm -hmm. subjunctive clauses, mm -hmm. you know, and other wonderful, wonderful, you know, grammatical structures. You don't have to teach them. Please don't. I think we are spending too much time teaching grammar. And we have not seen any, you know, important, significant results in our students' ability to speak and to use mm -hmm. the language. Mm -hmm. Remember that students are capable of mm -hmm. learning things independently. Mm -hmm. The guidance, the initial guidance that we provide is very important. And that initial guidance is teaching students the most useful words in the English language, number one, and secondly, the most useful grammatical structures in the English language. Yeah, if you are tempted to explain or to spend 10 minutes explaining the if clauses or conditional clauses number three, <laughs> please stop yourself because you're not doing, you know, you will never be able to teach that clause to your students. You will only be able to explain, but the students will only remember the rules. They will never be able to make use of that rule in, you know, authentic situations. Mm -hmm. That part, I think we know because, because research the past 30 or 40 years by very serious researchers have told us very, very clearly. Let me say this again, and I hope you remember this. And if you are looking for mm -hmm. the reference, I'm going to send it to you. Our ability to speak, to write, and to understand language, doesn't matter what language, maybe Thai language, English language, French, Japan, or whatever, depends heavily on implicit knowledge that we have developed over time, not on explicit knowledge. Explicit knowledge, the kind of things that we explain, that we spend time teaching in the classroom, has a very small uh, role in language acquisition. Maybe later, at the more advanced level, the students probably need a, a bit more explicit grammar knowledge mm -hmm. so that they can fix their own problems. If you are learning English to become an English language teacher, then yes, you need to know more about the grammar of the English language, but not your students. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Yusuf, yes. imagine Imagine if, 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 if from day number one, the moment you were born, your parents did not speak Thai to you <laughs> at all, but instead, <laughs> instead they were teaching you the grammar mm -hmm. of the Thai language uh -huh. explicitly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. every day, hey, Yusuf, please sit here. I'm going to explain mm -hmm. to you the grammatical rules of the Thai language. Do you think you'll be able to speak Thai at all? Mm -hmm. I don't oh. think so. Mm -hmm. yeah and, it's and obvious that that's not how we learn language mm -hmm. we learn language by understanding the language mm -hmm. and through yeah. repeated understanding somehow the grammatical structures the phrases the clauses the expressions mm -hmm. they stick in their head mm -hmm. dr will i have seen one yeah. word on our chat box it says yes. that teaching grammar communicatively so what, what does it mean <laughs> okay yes i think what it means actually is when the students read and they understand mm -hmm. 
-hmm. what they are reading. I think that is learning grammar communicatively. Mm -hmm. When they listen, when they watch a movie and they understand what the movie is all about, I think they are learning the language communicatively as well. So please remember, communicate doesn't mean speaking. No. Communicate means speaking and understanding as well. Mm -hmm. We always think about communication as talking, speaking, producing, and things like that. That is just one side of the story. For learning purposes, I think it's the uh, comprehension that is more important than the production. Let me say this again very carefully so that you don't get it wrong. For language learning purposes, for your students, what is more important is not for them to speak or to write, it's for them to listen, to read, and to understand. It is repeated understanding mm -hmm. to the language that slowly and gradually results in the ability to use the language for talking, speaking, and writing, not the other one. I think for many years we have gotten the wrong idea about how language is learned. Yusuf, yes. thank you very much for your question. <laughs> wonderful, <laughs> wonderful yeah. question. And uh, Ajahn Dr. Win Yusuf, Marat, yeah, yes. yeah. I, I, uh, I, while I'm listening to the, uh, Yusuf, uh, the question, the previous question, so I, it remind me for the last year, I remember once you taught us in the uh, last year about the, 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 this sentence about, please teach grammar in the simple sentence teach them the, exactly what you say today, you know, teach yep. students for what they use often in their, their daily life. And that, then yes. that day, you know, I guarantee everyone, I myself, I experienced with this, uh, with, with this theory, I could say, and mm -hmm. I apply this to my class. Yeah. You know, I apply this to my oral English class because I observed that my student, whenever I taught the complex sentence, mm -hmm. question yeah. tab, or whatever, if clause, and yeah. you know, they got zero. <laughs> and of they, course, they, yeah. yeah, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, they don't use it, they don't apply it to their daily mm. life. But then yeah. uh, when uh, I change my, my uh, adapt my teaching a, a bit, you know, try yes. to teach something that they can use in their daily life and it works, you know. Now they, I can see that they use Wonderful. it, you know. Yeah, like more motivated. Okay, this is I can confirm because I use it. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Thank you for the confirmation and yes. affirmation yes. as well. Incidental okay. learning, that's the way to go. Yeah. Incidental, Incidental learning, and okay. implicit ah, learning, okay. that's the way to go. Yes. Okay, really any more like, questions? <laughs> I, yeah, uh, I think, I, think uh, uh, mm -hmm. I, I recently learned uh, a concept called a global citizenship education. Yes. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I mean, I think it's, it's somehow a very really good point. I mean, in order to, mm. to, to, to integrate these kinds of concepts in English language teaching and learning practice, yeah. because I, I found that um, uh, when, basically when we teach, as the English teacher, when we teach our students to learn English language, for example, it's not mm. just only how to teach them how to speak fluently or confident, confidently, how to write English correctly, how to listen, yeah. read, and, and I mean, effectively, but uh, later on, the question is that how much we are prepared learner, our student, you know, to, to be a part of the global citizen after they have done their, their graduate, because yes. after they complete their degrees, they have to go mm. out and they have to leave, you know, uh, surrounded by different people who come from different cultural beliefs and backgrounds. So I, I think the uh, trying to increase uh, the sense of awareness uh, of becoming a global citizenship is another aspect of the mm. English yes. teacher should, to try to, to learn and try to integrate in their English learning classes. That's what I think. Yes, good point. I mean, I think that's another big theme today, uh, mm -hmm. becoming an important part of the world mm -hmm. as, as, a, as a user, as a speaker of, of, of the language, which is widely used in the world today. We become part of that international community mm -hmm. and responsible citizen uh, mm -hmm. for that matter as well. Well, thank you so okay. much, everyone. Yes, so now let me make sure that all of you have filling the form, the evaluation form or not. Ajalela, please again, please uh, send the evaluation for a uh, link into the chat box. And then, uh, wait, wait, one minute. last but not least, 
uh while while we are waiting for your survey for your for the form i'd like to take this opportunity to announce the next two events under psu in this month in case you are interested okay yeah, i have, I have to send the evaluation link uh to our chat box yeah okay i think you all seen right and of course may i introduce you the two more important events from us okay first as you can see in the screen or not? Not wait yet. For that. Okay. Not yet. Haven't seen. Not the yet. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Mm -hmm. Okay. Something interrupt in the sharing. Okay. Because I cannot share. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Fatima, okay, no. Mm -hmm. Okay. You want me to share, or you want to share? Yeah, I, uh, I, I would like you to share. Because, okay. Ah, okay. It's really uh, both events are really interesting and really helpful uh, mm. for teacher. Okay. First, uh, this is yes. It's about extensive reading, Doctor ah, Willie. There you go. That's yes. why I don't want to mention it. First, because mm. I want to surprise you. <laughs> yes, my two uh, good friends. Uh, will be held by our lecturer, Ajan, uh, Ajan Fatima Lailaje Ase. Okay, our beloved colleague. Okay, and if you are interested, you can uh, scan it now. And yeah. Yeah, you next, can scan the QR code for yeah, this. Code. And it, it will be held on uh, next week, Saturday, the 19th of November. And mm. you everyone are welcome. Mm -hmm. Yes. And next, uh, the second one from Associated Professor Dr. Fan Fang from Shantou University. Mm, that's uh, another good one. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. As you can see, it's about virtual visiting professor. Uh, the topic is about writing for publication. It will be held on 26 November uh, at the end of this month, 2022. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And yep, <laughs> register. Yes, yeah, yeah. Feel free to register because uh, I, I would like everyone to come back again so we can share, mm -hmm. we can meet again. <laughs> uh, uh, let's say build a connection. <laughs> yes, Ajahn Wen, mm -hmm. Ajahn Yusuf, I have to go, I, I have to okay. attend another meeting. Yes, sure. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, so thank you, sure. thank you very yes, much. Thank everyone. you very much, Dr. Yes. 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 Yes, please you say again for next, Yeah, uh, you, you have you another, another Ajahn section. Ming. Thank you very much. I have Thank another meeting that I have to attend. Yeah. Yes. Bye bye, everyone. See you bye again bye next everyone. Bye bye. Next Thanks year. for having me today. Okay. And now he has come the e, uh, the e certificate. Okay. It's really waiting for you because many participants asking me for where is the e certificate link, right? Okay. Just go to the chat box, click the link. Fill in your uh, information. I'm have, really have, sorry, uh, ma'am. When Morat, we cannot open the link. We ah. cannot. We, we don't have access to open. Mm. Something wrong with the link. In in the certificate. Uh, uh, when we when we if you want to you want to fill in the evaluation ah. link, we ah. cannot open it. Uh, in my case here, I can open. Okay. What up? You uh, read uh, in the it, chat box, it, it, a lot of uh, participants mm -hmm. inform that if you read in mm. the chat box, we, can, mm. we cannot open the link. Oh, of the I see. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so let, yeah. let me try. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay. The okay. Uh, by Yusuf uh -huh. cannot be open, but uh, mm. the, the barcode that you share can mm -hmm. be opened. Oh. The link so. shared by Yusuf, uh, it cannot okay. be opened. But okay, I can. You do, okay. Uh, okay, uh, for those. For those who are not able to open the mm. link to the evaluation form, uh, by the end of this section, uh, we are going mm -hmm. to send you by your email again ah, to, make okay. sure that, to, to make sure that you are able to uh, evaluate this session and also to make sure that you will be able to collect the certificate for today's session. Huh. Yes. Someone said the uh, the QR code works, so maybe you can scan from the QR code first if mm -hmm. you want to. Mm -hmm. okay. Try. Okay. Okay, let's try first. So this can be differentiated instruction, you know, Tan Yusuf, plan yes. A, plan B. <laughs> yes. 
we have the second plan. <laughs> okay. Okay, Ajahn, Ajahn Mimonat, have uh, you okay. have you sent the uh the uh e certificate link to the person? Yeah, yes, yes. yes. Uh, when we try to open it again, it's still yes. forbidden. Mm. This for is which one certificate or the evaluation, please? Evaluation. Oh, for the evaluation link, right? Of course. Uh, but can you scan? After, of course, after we fill the evaluation link, then we will get the certificate. Is that right? Oh, uh, yes. Oh, two different it? things. No, no, two, diff uh, two different links. There are two uh, different so, links. So that's why we need to fill in first the uh, evaluation link. Then later we can get the certificate. No, if uh, I'm not mistaken. The, no, no, no. Um, the link of the certificate and the link of the evaluation is different link. So uh, basically, uh, in the past, we combine mm -hmm. these two links together. But what mm -hmm. we found out is that uh, when we are uh, when we when when uh, when we when we, when we try to combine them, it seems like that most of participants they just mainly uh, fill <laughs> in the form of the uh, certificate. They mm -hmm. do not fill in the form of the evaluation. So that's, that's why we try to separate these two links to each other. So basically, we try to send uh, out uh, to you guys, to all of you to, to try to um, mm -hmm. complete the form of the evaluation first. And after that, we will send you another link uh, for the uh, certificate. Mm -hmm. But for those who are not able to uh, to evaluate the session today, you don't have to be worried because we are going mm -hmm. to send you again via your email to make sure that you are able to evaluate the session. But for now, uh, what is more important is that regarding you, regarding to, regarding your mm -hmm. certificate, uh, I am not sure if you are able to open the link of the certificate or not. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I opened it and it worked. And mm -hmm. it says your response has been recorded. Mm -hmm. That's all right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh. And after that, you will get the uh, certificate through your email directly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it seems like some people can open the yeah. link, but some people cannot. Uh, cannot. Open the link. Uh, I will check this. Uh, I mean, I will check this with my university. I get to make sure. Maybe it's because not the evaluation a... form because the evaluation form is provided is designed by the university staff. Uh -huh. So I have to go back and check with the yeah. university staff. But for the uh, for the certificate mm -hmm. one, we design by ourselves. So I hope <laughs> I hope the certificate one is work. It's worth mm -hmm. it. so yeah. everyone just make sure that you get the certificate. That's much more important to me. Yes, very beautiful one, very yeah. you know memorable. <laughs> but again, at the end of the section, I will we will send you another email to remind about these particular issues, mm -hmm. to make sure that you I mean all of you get the certificate and all of you are able to evaluate the session. Okay. So shall we say thank you for? To all participants, mm -hmm. Ajahn Yusuf, yes. Yes, sure. thank, yes, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Today's session is really act active and very insightful lecture, let's say. And I hope you have applied this uh, the knowledge gained today and also any new uh, information about 21st century mm -hmm. for English teacher, okay, for your uh, teaching technique or whatever in your daily life and see you again uh, for the next session okay, okay thank you very much thank you very much for stay safe stay strong yes, thank you very much yes thank you very much thank you, you very much thank you very much have a nice day yes have a nice day have a nice not weekend today just wednesday <laughs> Me uh, and yes. I mean, PSU lecturer, please stay here. Yes, me too. Yeah, I think maybe the device uh, in uh, for some participant, the device are not uh, compatible with with the the phone.